بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما تعلمنا وزدنا بفضلك علما وتعليما إنك على كل شيء قدير So, it says the acts of Hajj can be broken up into three types. Essential, i.e., if you didn't do this, there's no Hajj. Duties, things you have to do. It is haram not to do these things. You are sinful if you don't do these things. You must do these things, but you have still performed Hajj if you don't do these things. And then three, then three, the sunnas. Okay, these are things you should do, but if you don't do, you're not sinful. So it says the arkan of Hajj are five, the bare essentials, ihram, that you've entered ihram. This is the intention to perform the Hajj or the Umrah. It is preferred that one utters the words, I intend to perform Hajj uh, or the Umrah, and I sanctify myself. I enter pilgrim sanctity, thereby with God the ex exalted. Okay. So you're entering pilgrim sanctity. This does not mean that you do anything. This is merely an intention. It is sunnah to say something. And it is obligatory to remove your, the, the clothes that you can't wear um, from yourself and anything else that you can't do beforehand. However, the bare minimum is you say, I am entering pilgrim sanctity. Okay, that's the bare minimum. It is not valid to enter ihram for hajj except in the hajj months, which are shawwal, so that's straight after Ramadan, dhul qi'dah, which is straight after Ramadan, and then the first 10 days of the hijjah. The last of which is the dawn of the day of sacrifice. The day of sacrifice, Eid al-Adha, al right? So the dawn. So the last moment that you can enter ihram is one split second before fajr on Eid al-Adha. Okay, it's not possible to enter into ihram um, for hajj after that, nor is it possible to enter into ihram, for example, during Ramadan or in Sha'ban or some other month. You can't do it. It doesn't work. Okay? So you say you, you say in your head, I am entering ihram for hajj. Fantastic. <laughs> Done. The, main, uh, the remaining arkan are standing at Arafah, meaning being at Arafah. When you say al-wuquf bi Arafah, means being at Arafah, right? Arafah or Arafat, this is a particular area in the outskirts of Medina, or outskirts of Mecca, sorry. And uh, it's clearly designated, you are now in uh, Arafah. And you just have to be there. You don't have to stand, you don't have to pray, you don't have to be pure, you don't have to be awake. You just have to be sane. Right? Like, so you were asleep. You drove through it while asleep. Right? And the, the last split second of it, whatever it is, right? So, <clears throat> um, as long as you are there for a moment, that's enough. Okay? And that has a, that's very time sensitive because that only counts from Dhuhr on the day before Eid, right? Dhuhr on the day before Eid, on the 9th, right? That's the day of the Arafah. And Fajr on the next morning. So you've got that window of time to be there. If you are not there at all during that time, you have not done Hajj. Okay, you have not done Hajj. You've missed Hajj. Okay, so you have to be there at that time. Number three. The tawaf al ifada, right? So when you arrive on Hajj, right, or generally at the Kaaba in general, everybody does tawaf, right? You just arrive and you do tawaf. You can do tawaf at any time. Just do tawaf, tawaf anytime, right? Tawaf meaning go around the Kaaba with wudu, with your shoulders pointing the Kaaba um, uh, seven times. That's called tawaf, right? Going around the Kaaba seven times. So that's called tawaf. But tawaf al ifada is the special tawaf on Eid. That starts at Fajr. Okay, that starts at Fajr. On the beginning of Eid, and it ends the day you die. So it's not time sensitive. Right, so Arafah is time sensitive. Tawaf is not time sensitive. 
it starts from Fajr on that day of Eid. And any time after Fajr, you can do Tawaf al ifadah The next day, the day after, the day after, the day after, it doesn't matter when. Okay? So, number one, I'm entering Ihram. Number two, I'm at Arafah. Number three, I did my Tawaf some point after the day of Eid, on day of Eid and after. And the Sa'i, which is between going between uh, Safa and Marwa. Right, so those two go in hand in hand. You go, you go seven times around the Kaaba, and then you go and pray uh, Sunnah behind Maqam Ibrahim, and then which is connected to the Kaaba, you go and do between Safa and Marwa. Okay, and then sometime, either before or afterwards, you cut, you cut your hair or you shave your hair. So meaning you you remove at least three hairs by at least about a centimeter and a half, approximately about an inch, about a centimeter and a half, right? So you shaved your whole head, uh, you cut some of your hair, you sh you, sh you shorten most of your hair. As long as you've got three hairs done, and it's been shortened by at least uh, a centimeter, uh, uh, you know, a centimeter and a half, that you've done that obligation. That is Hajj. Have you done Hajj or not? Yes or no? Right. This is this is what we're talking about. Okay, that makes sense. This is great. Okay. Now the arkan of Umrah, the mini Hajj, right? The lesser pilgrimage. They are the same as the arkan of Hajj with the exception of Arafah, which is not one of them. So on when you go to Umrah, A, you can do it any time of the year. And B, you it's, 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 there's no Arafah in it. There's no standing Arafah. So you enter any time of the year. Uh, you enter into Ihram for Umrah. You say, I'm visiting the Kaaba. And that's my intention. I am now in Pilgrim Sanctity for visiting the Kaaba. And then you go on the Kaaba seven times. And then you go between Safa and Marwa. And then you shave your head. Done. Easy peasy. Right? That's it. That's Umrah. Now, Tawaf and Sa'i. The necess necessary for Tawaf are A, covering your Aura. So when you say you have to do Tawaf, you also have to fulfill the conditions of Tawaf. So you have to cover your Aura. Okay, so that includes covering one's feet for a woman, for example. Okay, uh, the state of tahara being pure. So you do not need to be pure to enter ihram. You do not need to be pure to do arafah. You do not need to be pure even for safa and marwa. You do have to be pure for, uh, um, for tawaf. It doesn't count. Right, number one, a woman obviously can't be in a masjid on your period, A. And then B, it it, it doesn't count. You can't do tawaf, so you can't pray when you're on your when, when someone's on the period or they need to make also, for example. Right. So that doesn't count. So you have to have you are pure from menstruation, pure from the intermediate uh, from Janaba, and pure from al hadath al asghar meaning you've made you need to you make, need to make wudu. So if your wudu breaks in the middle of tawaf, what do you do? You go and make wudu and you complete from wherever you left off. Right? The the tawfa, that single circumambulation that you're in the middle of, that doesn't count. And you build on the previous number that are complete. So however many complete circles you've done, you've done one, two, you broke your wudu in your middle of your middle of number three three, you go and make wudu, and then you're gonna do another five. Right. So whatever two that you've completed or three that you've completed, you build on that, and then you go to uh, the next one. Um, the state of tahara from things which invalidate and from najasa, you have urine on you, you have whatever it is, right? Number three, that the tawaf is seven cycles inside the prayer area. So you are not, for example, going around it from space and being a thousand miles away from the, from the center of the Kaaba, right? You're in that area. So you're close enough to be in that what's called the, the praying area. Okay, you're close enough to be in the masjid, but you're not inside the Kaaba, right? That's going to be number four. And keeping the Kaaba to one's left, right? So that mean, meaning you draw a line from your right shoulder to your left shoulder. It should be pointing at the Kaaba the whole time. Now, the Kaaba is not a dot, right? The Kaaba is a square. It's a cube. So you could move a little bit, right? It could be pointing one way or the other. But if you're shoulders are no longer pointing towards the Kaaba and you move forward or backwards 
right? You move forward, that doesn't count. You've got to go backwards and keep going, right? So even when you when you pass the black stone, you turn to it, you stop, you touch the black stone if you can, kiss the black stone if you can, uh, wave the black stone and kiss your hand if you can, turn back and then keep going, right? You cannot be moving sideways. You have to be with your shoulders per perpendicular, not perpendicular, in line towards the Kaaba. <laughs> Excuse me. And you're not actually inside the Kaaba. Now, this doesn't really apply today. What it used to apply is they used to have had the Shadarwan. Shadarwan was this like ledge sticking out of the bottom of the Kaaba. So people used to walk along that ledge, right? And so that's actually yeah, considered inside the Kaaba. Or they'd walk along with their hand. Their hand was on the Kaaba. So imagine when you're walking along with your hand touching the Kaaba, right? So it's over that ledge. That means your hand is actually inside the Kaaba. So that doesn't count. So you're supposed to touch the corners of the Kaaba. But you're not supposed to move while you're touching the corners of the Kaaba. Okay. And so um, you walk in. So now they, what they've done is they've removed those ledges. So nobody can climb on them anymore. And they're now just slanted. So that doesn't really apply anymore. Um, but you could, again, if someone's moving with the hand on the Kaaba, that wouldn't count. So you gotta, you can't do that. Touch the corner of the Kaaba, right? And then uh, move on. The Sa'i must be done seven times. So Sa'i is seven times. and must begin at Safa and Marwa. So you start at Safa and you go to Marwa, that's one. Marwa to Safa, two, etc. right? If you're not sure, how many I have done, or where did I start? It's very easy. Just keep going. Do another two. So did I do five, or did I do six, or did I seven? I'm not sure. Okay, do another two, and that's it. Did I did I start a sofa, or did I start a marwa? I honestly don't know. It's my first time. I'm confused. Just do another one. And then you go an extra one, and then that's it. So now you've done either eight, starting from, from sofa, or you've done seven and you started at marwa and that didn't count it's not a big deal okay now you do not need to have wudu for safa and marwa right but if for tawaf you do at tawaf you have to have wudu um now what's one problem in the shafi school about keeping wudu and tawaf What one thing can we imagine? The streaking bumping the into shafi. somebody, bumping into somebody of the uh, bumping into system. somebody, right? And so this is a very good exercise in the in the in the in the principle al yatin la yizur b'shek, right? The certainty is not listed by doubt. So I'm on tawaf, and there's men and women all around me, and I have bare feet on, right? And many of these women have bare feet, right? As and as you mentioned in the shafi school, that doesn't count. You can't do tawaf with bare feet in the shafi school, um, as a woman. But anyway, there's women around me that have bare feet. So around me, there's one, two, there's like 10 people all around me, okay? Men and women. And they also have hands, right? And so if you, if you say, what is the chances of a woman not touching me in tawaf, right? What, what, what estimation would you give me? Let's say it's totally crowded. What's the chances? Slim to none. Slim to none. Okay. So does slim is slim to none the same as yaqeen? Is the same as certainty? The answer is no. So I know I made wudu 100%. Wallahi al-azim, I made wudu. Okay. Is it true? Wallahi al can you swear by Allah that a woman touched you? No. So your wudu is not broken by the mere likelihood. When it's slim to none, that doesn't change things. The default is you still have wudu. So that's number one. Don't look at who just touched you. Right, focus on what you're doing. Number one, we should be lowering our gaze. Right, the default when you're praying in the Kaaba is you should look at the Kaaba. That's the default, right? When you're looking at the Kaaba, the default is you should look at the Kaaba. That's on the assumption that there's no women around. Otherwise, you look down. So you should be lowering your gaze as much as humanly possible, right? So don't look, don't know. Okay, so I remember I did all my on my on my on when I was doing Hajj, I did all of my tawafs. And uh, I managed to keep wudu, no problem. And in my final tawaf, this woman put her hand in my face, right? So then what should I say? Maybe she's a man, right? I mean, that's a bit, that's getting a bit ridiculous, right? That's getting a bit ridiculous. Maybe maybe I was insane at that point. Like, that's, again, ridiculous, right? So we're not going to go to something ridiculous. And so here we say, fine, 
even if you're not going to apply that, is it a good idea, right? Is it a good idea to ask everybody on Hajj to go and make wudu every single time? Or more of a practical thing, what if you are doing a tawaf with your wife and you are standing right behind her in order to protect her, right? And you're holding her hand in order to protect her. Right? Is that not a maslaha shara'iyah? Is that not something that's really important? That's important, right? Unfortunately, things happen to women in the mataf, right? They shouldn't, right? And so that's a, that's a, there's a maslaha shara'iyah, right? You're saying, right, I'm going to stand right behind my wife. Uh, I'm going to be there behind her, for example. Okay? So now she, and she's holding her hand half the time. So now every single time, every single time she holds your hand, you stop, walk out, Go downstairs to the bathroom, come back up again, and cause more congestion and difficulty, given the thousands of people who are there. Is that a good idea? That's not a good idea, right? And so we have to use, uh, you know, uh, we have to use, there's, there's a default rule in the Shafi school, and there's also hikmah, right? Given that the other three madahib say that, hey, as long as you don't touch with lust, it doesn't break your wudu, right? As long as you don't touch with lust, it doesn't break wudu, right? then it is of a benefit to one itself and to other people and to the whole group of people, given that they're trying to stop congestion, just to uh, take it a bit easy, right? Take it a bit easy. You know, there is a, it is a very weak position. It's not really followable in the Shafi school. I guess it is followable, but very weak position in the Shafi school that touching doesn't break wudu unless it's done with lust. That's a very weak position, right? Uh, there's a strong position, though, strong position that being touched doesn't break your wudu. So again, in my scenario, this lady put her hand in my face, right? According to a strong position in the Shafi school, right? The verse of the Quran says, oh, la masta or if you touch women, it doesn't say if you're touched by women. The strong get a girl position in the Shafi school is there's no difference, right? There's no difference. The point is skin contact, skin contact. That's the relied upon position. The weaker position, which is also strong, right? Held by many, many Shafis, and is a strong argument, is that being touched does not break your wudu. Right, that's a strong position in the Shafi school. It's not the relied upon position, but it is a strong position. So regardless, don't make things ridiculous. Uh, don't think, make, think things ridiculous and don't make things very difficult for other people. If everybody kept leaving the haram, well, thousands of people there and, and going to the bathroom, there's a, a long queue of people going to the bathroom and it's increasing congestion. That's not a, not a wise thing to do, right? Either. Wait for a better time. Wait till, I don't know, some other time. Wait till the third day, fourth day, fifth day, I don't know. Wait some another time or do something else, right? Does that make sense? Okay. So we have to have, uh, there's, there's, you know, when you say wisdom in the Sharia, you have to know kind of how the Sharia works a little bit, eh? You have to know what, what the kind of debate is. You can't just come along and say, hey, that's not very practical. I'm not going to do it. Right, so like, hey, I was on a holiday with all my non-Muslim relatives, and they only brought pork. So it's not very practical. So I ate pork. It's not like that. Here I'm saying, look, majority of scholars from time of the Sahaba to today have said what you're talking about is not an issue. It's not an issue. You're not. It doesn't break wudu. Right. So don't make such a big deal about something. Another example. Right. You are Hanafi. Okay. And the Hanafi prayer time for Asr comes later than anybody else. Are you going to sit there or the whole the whole uh, of the Haram is praying Asr and sit there and wait for, and say, no, I'm not going to pray Asr? So, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's true. You're being more precautious in that Asr is debated, has it come in or not? And according to the Hanafis, it hasn't come in yet. That's great. But is that really, like, is that really wise? Given that the majority of scholars, in fact, many, many Hanafis as well, have said that Asa comes in earlier. Right? So, I mean, you want to pray and then pray again later, maybe, but like you just missed Jama'ah. You missed the group prayer in in the Ka in the front of the Kaaba with the Imam. Right? Um you know, that's, that's a bit extreme. Again, some people don't know. They're not being extreme. They just didn't know. They're just confused. Why is everybody praying Asr early? Right? 
But then there are other things we say, well, what if they did everything wrong? You know? What if they did it all wrong? So if they're doing something wrong, there's something different, right? You know, somebody asked a similar question. They said, Sheikh, is it halal to pray behind the Imam in front of the, ha the Kaaba, given that he's Salafi, given that he's Wahhabi? Like, subhanAllah. You know? What a question. You know, uh, Sayyidina Umar, Ibn Umar, Sayyidina Ibn Umar, he was there in, in the, in the Kaaba, he was in Mecca at the time of the civil war between the Zubayrids, right? And the and the Bani Umayyah. So the Umayyads they had, you know, they were they were it was time with the Umayyads. And Abdullah ibn Zubayr had claimed to be the Khalifa and had started a rebellion in Mecca. Okay, in this time of the Sahaba. So Ibn Umar is there. You know what he would do? He said, during that civil war, sometime the Zubayrids would have control of the area, and sometimes the Umayyads would have control of it. He says, I'll pray behind anybody. He says, if you come and ask me to come and do something good, you ask me to pray, I'll pray with you. So if my brother in Islam is asking me to pray, I'll pray with him. If my brother in Islam is asking me to go and kill another Muslim, I'm going to say no. Right? See how it was? Right? His attitude is like, I'm not on this side or that, or that side. I just want to pray. <clears throat> I just want to pray. If you doubt about the prayer, repeat it. But subhanAllah, you're not going to pray. What, imagine if it was taken over by Shia. You say, I'm not going to pray in the, in the Kaaba because it's got Shia. Right? So there's, you know, subhanAllah. Right? So there's sometimes, you know, people are very, very, um, you know, narrow-minded about things. And sometimes it's genuine um, ignorance, right? In which case, it's not a big problem. They just have to be educated. And sometimes it's, it's more than that. Right. May Allah protect us. So we have to be wise, understanding, and genuinely, genuinely with fiqh, we make things easy for other people and harder for ourselves. And sometimes you make it e harder, easier for yourself if it makes things easier for other people. Such as you're with your wife, and every two minutes you go and make wudu. She's like, "Oh my God, when are we going to finish the tawaf?" Right? Or you with your grand, your granddad, or your grandma, or whatever it is, um, whatever it is, whatever the situation. When you're traveling, the sunnah is not to join prayers while you're traveling. Right? You shouldn't do it. But you're trying to make things easy for other people. Show your kids that the deen is easy. Show your give you give your wife a break, give the older people a break. Give the people who are not gonna pray. Half the people don't even pray when they're traveling, right? So you say, Hey, this is easy. Just pray to Rakaz Dohor, to Rakaz Asar, go and chill, go and play in the arcade games, do whatever you want. Oh, that's cool. Right? The deen is easy as opposed to making it very hard for other people. You're not trying to make it easier on yourself for the sake of yourself, for the sake of your ego. You're trying to show them how to make things easy or to be available, right? To be available for them. On the joint Dhuhr or Asr so that, hey, I'm available. Anything happens. I'm not like, oh, I have to pray this or do that. And make things easy for people. Okay, so now we mentioned, that's Tawaf and Sa'i. I said the duties, things that you have to do. So you must do these on Hajj. If you don't do this on Hajj, you're sinful. But the Hajj still counts if you don't do it. And you're going to have to expiate. You have to, to, to sacrifice usually or some other things as well uh, uh, for missing these things. But you've still done Hajj. The words about of Hajj are being in the state of Ihram from the Miqat. So there's an imaginary line, okay, an imaginary line around, an imaginary circle around the Kaaba. This is called the Miqat, okay? It comes out some, I don't know. A couple hundred, well, I guess a couple hundred kilometers, or um, maybe less than that, and uh, it's for different for, uh, and so you know, so the Prophet Sallam said that people coming from Yemen, this is their miqat, and people who come from Iraq, this is their miqat, miqat, etc., 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 and so for us, usually coming from the the west, it's usually next to Jeddah, it's in Jarfa. Jarfa is, is an abandoned city now, or abandoned village, it doesn't exist anymore, um, but it's um. Yeah, it's next to Jeddah, so approximately Jeddah, right? So before you cross, before you fly over Jeddah, you have to enter Ihram. So can you enter Ihram afterwards? Yes, you can. But you're sinful for doing that. And you have to go back if you can. And if you miss it, you're going to have to expiate. Number two, spending the night before the day of slaughter at, at Muzdalifah, right? So Muzdalifah, you have to spend the night, meaning uh, uh, be there for a portion of the second half of the night. 
So you can be there in the last second before Fajr, and that's enough. Again, when you say being there, you do not have to sleep, you don't have to do anything. But it's worth noting, interestingly, that it is not recommended to pray to Hajjud. Right? It's not recommended to pray to Hajjud before uh, uh, before Eid, which is interesting. Right? Just like on Hajj, it's not recommended to fast on Arafah. Right? So it's a very Hajj is very interesting. It's like a very different type of ibadah, right? Fasting is one type of ibadah. Prayer is another type of ibadah. Hajj is a totally different type of ibadah. Right? It's very different. So it's interesting, right? You're not you, you're kind of moving more than you are quote unquote worshipping. Right? And so um you know it's interesting. Um Spending the two nights of Tashriq at Mina. Right? Spending the two nights of, of, of Tashriq at Mina. So that's uh that's so after Eid, so it's Eid right now. You went to Mina and you slaughtered, and then you went to Mecca and you did your tawaf and you did your sa'i and you shaved your head, or you shaved your head at Mina. And now you're going to have to go back to Mina and spend the night in Mina, which is going to be the night that comes before the 11th, and then the night that comes before the 12th, and then the night that comes before the 13th, unless you leave before the, before the night. So it's going to be two to three nights, depending if you leave early or not. So spending the night, the two nights of Tashriq at Mina, right? A.M. at Tashriq, which is two nights or three nights. Um, we usually refer to them as three nights. I'm not quite sure. which is it's two nights, but so anyway, so you have Eid. That's the tenth. The next day is the eleventh. So you have to spend that night that follows the tenth and before the eleventh. There, the night of the now today now it's the eleventh. You're going to stone at Mina on the eleventh. Then you're going to spend the night at Mina. And now it's the twelfth. If you leave today before Maghrib, you, you're gone. Otherwise, you, you otherwise you're going to spend the night and you're going to stone the next day as well. And it says throwing against the pillars, which doesn't really mean literally. So the pillars there, if you, you go and see the pillars on Hajj, there obviously they are they're not they haven't been there since Hansen Ibrahim. Those pillars are not pillars to be stoned. Those pillars are markers of what you should throw the stone into. Okay, so there is the, there are the pits there. You are throwing into the pits, you're not throwing this pillar. And so, in fact, to be pedantic. If you were to intend, I throw this stone in order to hit the pillar, I suppose I'm throwing the stone in order to get it into the thing that the pillar is marking. It wouldn't actually count because you're not th you're not throwing the you're not throwing the stone into the into the pit. You're trying to hit the hit the thing. And unfortunately, people sometimes throw really really hard and it bounces off and you might harm somebody, right? And we have to understand that harming any of Allah's cre creation at any time is scary, right? But what about on Hajj, in a sacred place like that? Right, very, very scary. Right, so we should be really, really, really scared of harming people and being rude to people on Hajj because it's like a, it's scary to be number one. Right, Judgment Day, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala forgive us our sins, inshallah Taala. But every single thing that we did to any person at any time, Allah is going to say stop. We now have to ask that person to forgive you. Right, it's very, very scary, very, very serious. May Allah forgive us all. Right. And given we have husband and wife here, a good question to ask husband and wife. And a scary thing. Who do you think we're gonna harm you could you have the potential to harm the most in our lives? Uh, children, maybe? Possibly children. You could do a lot of harm. Or your or your spouse. Your spouse, right? Do you think it's easier to hurt the emotions of your spouse than your child? It depends, but usually your spouse, right? Because they are, they they've invested more emotionally than anybody else. So for you to to hurt their feelings, to say something, right, that hurts them or scathing or whatever it is. So whenever we see our spouse, we're like ah, <laughs> like it's like it's scary, right? Meaning we fear Allah concerning that person, right? That mabda, obviously there's rahma, there's love, there's this, there's that, but it's like super scared of this person. Vis-a-vis -vis what could happen judgment day, 
right? The rights of one's spouse, the rights of one's wife, or the right one's rights of one's, you know, she'll always like, be asking that question, uh, you know, because that's very scary, right? And inshallah ta'ala, we have mabda of musamaha that we forgive. Inshallah, say, please, if I've done anything too wrong to you, please forgive me. And we try and, you know, just go to sleep at night, forgive any grudges, and etc. But from one side of it, you should, you should be very, very scared because this person, it's so easy to wrong them. It's so easy to wrong them. So you're on Hajj, for example, and you're like, ah, you're always late. Come on, let's go. It's like, subhanAllah, did you have to say that you're always late? You know, that, that statement, you're always late, that's hurt, hurtful. Did you have to say that? Right? And it's like, why? And you just said it on Hajj in front of the Kaaba, subhanAllah, right? Or right next to the Kaaba. Right, so to begin with, that statement, oh, you're always late, come on. That statement is frozen in time now. Judgment day. Inshallah, you prayed, you didn't pray, you drank alcohol, you did something to wrong yourself. That's forgiven. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just forgive you. Don't worry about it. All forgiven. But that statement, ah, oh, you're late. Why are you always late? It's not going to be forgiven. Allah is going to say, or ask your wife, ask your husband, or whoever's around you, whatever it is. So we should be really, really careful you know, about these uh, this, this sense of hurma, of everything around me is sacrosanct, and everything around me is Allah is going to ask me about these people, about these things, right? Very, very careful. Throwing trash, for example, on the floor, right? Uh, parking in the wrong place, whatever it is, these things are major things that we should be very, very careful of. May Allah forgive us. And so many people just completely don't, don't have no, no clue about it, right? You know, like, like what's worse, touching the mushaf with that wudu or throwing trash? Throwing trash is way worse. Because judgment day, you throw the trash on the street, everybody who has a right to the street will ask you, why did you throw trash on my street? <laughs> like a thousand voices. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, hey, I gave you mushaf for your benefit, not for my benefit. And I told you to show respect to the mushaf for your benefit, not for mine. And you stopped yourself from benefiting, subhanAllah. I'm angry with you because you... Cut off your nose to spite your face. Why did you do that? But I'll forgive you. That's all. As opposed to other rights of other people not be forgiven. Right? So we have to be very, very careful um, with these things. We cannot protect us. Okay. Um, so, um, being in the state of Miqal. Okay. Spending the night before the day of Wazdalafa. Uh, spend the day, throwing against the stone. So be very careful. Don't harm people. Don't push. Right. Also, someone was on Hajj. Was on Hajj, and the some of the, there was a big. Sh everyone was like, "Oh, trying to get here and trying to get there." And the Prophet ﷺ said, "Guys, chill out." Right. In the birra laysa bil He said, uh, "He said, goodness, comprehensive morality is not by rushing around." So many people on Hajj are like, "Got to get here. Got to get." Here. They're obviously they're stressed. They're traveling. They're this and that, and they're trying to get this, trying to get that. But you're worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're not worshipping right rituals. So don't run around, don't push around, just go cool, calm, collected, slow. There's a dispensation, follow it, make things easy for people. Uh, take your time, make sure people are arrested, make sure people aren't getting sick, make sure people aren't under pressure, and do things slowly, right? Um, and I, I, one of the things I advise people to do on Hajj is don't go on the buses. It's a total waste of time. Like so much time just sitting on a bus. If you're with elderly and they honestly can't walk, but otherwise just walk. You're not walking that far. Right? I think from from Arafah to had to, to to Mecca was like an hour, two hours, you know. So just get used to walking, right? Walk an hour, two hours. Can you walk for three hours? Can you walk for four hours? Just get used to walking. And then you can just do things by yourself. You can't really get lost. Right? There's like a huge sign saying Mecca, all huge roads saying go to Mecca, go to Wazdalafa. It's not it's not that difficult. You don't know. So people just do things slowly. You should walk by default, right? And, uh, you know, you go with you go with teenagers that are healthy. Just walk. Okay, spending the two nights of minna, throwing against the pillars, towards the pillars, right? And the farewell tawaf. So this applies to anybody leaving Mecca. You are leaving Mecca and you're going traveling distance from Mecca. For example, you're going to Hobar. You live in Mecca and you're going to Hobar, for example. You live in Mecca, you're going to Oman. You go live in Mecca, you're going to see someone's house. It doesn't matter if you're on Hajj or not on Hajj. Anybody who leaves Mecca and goes far away has to do the farewell tawaf, which is going around the Kaaba seven times before you leave. Again, with wudu, with your rakabat, etc., the same thing.
Okay. Um, so we did this. Where's page 14? Yeah. Sunders of Hajj. Sunders of Hajj include uh, any questions so far about the Wajibat and everything? Uh, would doing a Umrah on your way out of Mecca count as the farewell tawaf? Or if you took yourself outside of Ihram after you completed a Umrah, then you would go back and do the seven more? To make it the farewell to off? I don't think you can do that as far as I know. As far as I know. Uh, as far as I know, you cannot, that doesn't count. You have to do the foot to off of the wada itself, the farewell to off itself. Allahu Akbar. Now, there is a position that it is sunnah and that is supported by the fact that a woman who is on her period does not have to do to off of the wada. Right? So, you know, she's going to miss the flight. She's going to miss the whatever. She, she's just excused, right? And so well, there's also a position. Now, imagine, for example, you're with your uncle and he's elderly and it's it's very difficult for him to keep wudu, right? And it takes him about 10, 15 minutes to make wudu when you really have to go, right? It was very hard for him. It was very, very difficult. Like it took you like five hours to do the tawaf, right? It's very hard for him to get into the haram, da, 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 da. You know, there is, there is that position as well that it's just merely sunnah and not obligatory. Okay, the sunnahs, uh, the sunnahs include all acts which should be done, but which are not included among the arkan. So morally, what does it mean to do the sunnahs? We spoke about this before. Is When you say sunnahs, you don't, it's, not, it's not true to say you don't have to do sunnahs. You do have to do sunnahs, right? They are ma'mur biha, right? They are things that have been commanded for us to do, right? However, there is no threat of hellfire. So hellfire and no hellfire is an eschatological difference, meaning what happens when I get to the other side? That's a physical, right? A physical um, and eschatological difference. As opposed to morality, what is good or bad? So when you say have to, right? You have to do this. You can do this, right? Right? It's not true to say you don't you don't have to do sunnahs. You do have to do sunnahs. Like you are doing something. Allah has commanded us to do sunnahs, right? He, so that's something that we have to do, and He has command and He has commanded us to follow the sunnah, and we do have to follow the sunnah. But it just ha but it's just that there is no threat of hellfire. For. For for not doing it, okay. But that's something else. And we spoke about this before and we'll repeat it because it's useful. Okay. It's like the following. So you say, I don't have to pray sunnahs. Why am I praying sunnahs? I don't have to memorize Quran. I don't have to do this. I don't have to, I don't have to pray in the masjid. So I just pray at home. Right. What does that mean? Uh, that's like saying, I asked my wife, hey, could you make me a cup of tea? I'm teaching a class. She's like, do I have to? And I'm like, I mean, I'm just asking you if you can do it. So she says, okay, Fareed. Will you divorce me if I don't make a cup of tea? And I'm like, no. She's like, I'm not going to do it then. It's like, okay. So then I say, hey, um, you want to go for coffee? And she's like, do I have to? And I'm like, no. Will you divorce me if you don't go for a cup of tea? I said, no, I just thought it'd be nice just to hang out, you know? Um, I've been busy this week. You've been busy this week. She's going to hang out. She's like, mm, do I have to? I say, no. Will you divorce me if I just don't want to go with you? And I'm like, no, no, not really. And then she she's going to the shop and I'm like, hey, can you get me this? Like, do I have to? Like, imagine every single time she asks me this question, this is the this is the conversation that's happening every single time. Like, what kind of marriage do we have? Like, imagine if you're like, you, you, you know, you're here in this class, you hear this class, and then you overhear me and my wife have this conversation, and she's asking that every every two minutes. I'm like, wow. Like, that's a pretty bad marriage, right? That's like, she's like, basically like, I don't want to do anything you say. Well, I'm interested in not getting divorced because whatever practical reasons, right? Like, that's a really like strange relationship, right? So the same thing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Lillahi al-method a'la, not saying you're married to Allah, of course. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do, do something, and you're like, give it, do I have to? It's kind of a, it's a funny kind of question, right? It's like, it's not really... It is off. The, the mentality to begin with is off. 
right? As opposed to, of course, Allah, like, I love you, my Lord, I want to do something for you, right? And like you ask me to do something, of course you have to do it if Allah asks you, right? As opposed to you keep asking the question, yeah, but Allah, have you punished me, threatened me with hellfire or not? That's something eschatological that's to do with hellfire, and that's, not, that's like a bit pretty extreme, right? That's pretty extreme, okay? Um, does that make sense? So when you say sunnas, so that's that's a practical one. Practically, so can I, can I, can I miss, so, but I, I thought I could miss sunnas. You can miss sunnas for other more important sunnas. And you can miss sunnas for a wajibat. So right now, for example, they're about to pray in the masjid, like now, and now is Maghrib, right, where we are right now. I'm not going to go to the prayer. Why? Because, if I, because I, I'm going to have to, in order to pray Maghrib uh, in the masjid, every week, what will happen is every single day, my prayer time, will, the, the every single week it will change. And eventually, there will be no consistency in this class and the next class. And there's, if there's no consistency, the class won't happen. And so this is a more important sunnah, or arguably fard, than that. So I'm going to do this, right, as opposed to do that. Right. Otherwise, I the attitude, oh, yeah, I'd have to pray in the masjid. That's that's a pretty per perverted, right? I use that phrase, perverted, like weird way of thinking. Oh, why do I have to be in the masjid? Right? Why do I have to be in the masjid? It's not, um, it's not, uh, no, it's not, it's not, it's not how we think, right? You say I'm only, you say oh, Allah, I will try my best to do every single thing that you love, and I will only not do that thing that you love, Ya Allah. Because there's something else that you love more. Right? So the same thing you say, sunnahs of hajj, you don't have to do them. Right? That, that's not that's not really true. Right? It means there's no threat of hellfire if you don't do them. And there is no legal reper repercussions, meaning like if you miss it, there's nothing to, to do. Right? But have you missed out on something? Yeah. And if you think about it on Judgment Day, like you missed out on something. Just imagine, so analogy. Your son died in his sleep last night. And you didn't kiss him goodnight. You know? You didn't read him the story. Or you didn't do whatever it was. It's like, man, if only. Like, you, like, what is it worth to go back and, like, just hold him, right? Or just do this or just do that or something or just whatever it is. And you missed out. Same thing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. Those who believe they love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than it, more than anybody else loves Allah and more than they love anything else. And you missed up and you go on judgment day, that pain of I could have done this, these muafaqat, things that you could have done that Allah loved, and you missed out on them. You could have done this, you could have done that, and you didn't. It's gonna it's gonna kill us so badly, it's gonna hurt so bad that you could have done something. So it's just important to, to to, you know, when I say, son, oh, the things you don't have to do, the, the, you know, why are you even telling me the things I don't have to do? It doesn't mean that. It means there's no threat of punishment. Um, whoever misses out a rukun, his hajj will not be valid and it is permitted for him to leave, uh, and it's not permitted for him to leave the haram until he com 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 completes it. Right now, if you miss Arafah, what do you do? You Your hajj turns into an umrah and you complete it as an umrah. An atonement pen, a payment for a penalty known as dam will not make up for it. So if you miss harafa, you can't just like sacrifice an animal and be like, it's okay. Nor, there's a typo here, nor can another person do it for him. Three of the arkan always, uh, will, will always be binding as long as a person is still alive. They are the tawaf, because it has no time limit, the sa'i, and no time limit, and shaving the head. Right. So someone's like, yeah, I, I didn't cut my hair at all. Ever. At all. You're like, oh, so when did you do Hajj? Two years ago. Well, you have to do it now. You still haven't done Hajj. Your Hajj isn't complete yet. Whoever misses out a wajib, his his uh, his Hajj is accepted, but he has to pay the damn penalty as a sacrifice, or there's other things as well. He will be in a state of sin if he misses out uh, without a legitimate reason, meaning a threat of hellfire. But whoever misses out a sunnah, his hajj is accepted, and he is not in a state of sin. I, there's no, if he is in a state of disobedience, then. So sin and disobedience are not the same thing. You are disobeying. Obeying, you obeyed, disobeyed. You, you said, I know what you want, Allah, but I just didn't do it. 
right? Intentionally with no particular reason, but there's no threat of punishment and does not have to pay a, a damn penalty. Although he has missed out on a great deal of blessings, right? That can never be come back, right? It is not permitted for a man to cover his head in a hat or a blanket or a turban or for a woman to cover her face while in state of ihram. They are not permitted to cover even part of them. Now, so here's a question. What on earth are you supposed to do? I'm oh, I'm a woman and I'm wearing a hijab. If I don't cover a part of my face, if I don't cover a part of my face, then I have to have the hijab exactly on the line between my face, which is exposed, and my neck, which has to be covered. And my hair or that has to be covered on my face, which has to be exposed, right? So does the Sharia ask me to do that, to be ex so exact? Is that even human, humanly possible? The answer is no. So because I have to cover a part of my face, even the tiniest part of my face, in order to cover everything beyond the face. But then if I cover my face, I'm doing something haram. So here, this is where masalih come in. So we hear talk, people talking about maqasid, sharia, right? The sharia, the maqasid, the sharia, this, the sharia is trying to do this, sharia is trying to do that. And then they go on a whole tangent and they're totally derailed. The sharia came to give women rights, so therefore women don't have to wear hijab and they should be in the workplace and uh, women should have a right to divorce themselves and, and, and. It's like, subhanAllah, uh, brother, like you've gone on a total tangent. So there's a whole sub discussion in fiqh, which is maqasid, sharia. Right, and we use Makati to Sharia to solve things like this. When I'm between a rock and a hard place, what is the Sharia trying to do? Either she covers her face and does the sin of covering her face in ihram, or she exposes some of her, of her neck and chin and hair, which is haram. Like which haram? Where do we? What do I do here? Now you have to think for Allah. Now you have to put yourself in Allah's throne, Subhanahu wa Taala. Right. I'm using hyperbole here, right? And do tashriya. You have to make up the sharia and you have to say, I'm thinking for Allah. So the time that you think for Allah is when Allah has asked you to think for Allah and put you between a rock and a hard place. Is it A or is it B? And is it this or is it this? And I have to think as if I'm Allah. Okay? Now, that doesn't apply when Allah has already given his opinion. Right? Allah has already given his opinion. You don't come along and change the sharia with maqasid. Say, well, Allah's trying this, trying to achieve this, trying to achieve this. When you're in a rock and a hard place, now is the question. What do I do? How does sharia work? How does Allah work? How does Allah want me to worship him? Now you have to say, what's more important? Fulfilling, keeping to the sanctity of ihram by exposing the face or keeping to the sanctity of the woman by covering anything beyond the face? And the answer is the sanctity of the woman is more important. Okay, so that's where maqasa sharia comes comes in when you're balancing these things. And in fact, whenever you do analogy, you always have to think for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like what is Allah trying to do? You eliminate the irrelevant things that Allah doesn't care about, and you think about things that Allah does care about, and use that to guide your analogy. Right? You're thinking with the thought process of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that doesn't allow you to autocorrect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, well, in our time, for example, homosexual marriage is okay because it achieves this or whatever it is. Does that make sense? Yes. Right. Okay. Um Now, sometimes it has a slightly more strong use, okay, in some exceptions, but that's that's very limited. But this is this is really really you can see it, and so you have to. You, it comes up all, all the time, again and again and again. When you have to weigh up two things and weigh up two things, weigh up two things, and when we don't have the answer, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala hasn't given the answer. There's no hadith. There's no verse of the Quran. But you have to look at the meaning. What is the whole goal of the Sharia, and then come back and try and do those things. It is not permitted to perform a marriage ceremony or to have sexual intercourse or acts which lead to them or to, um, sorry, it's not permitted to cut the one's nails or hair or put on oil on, on the hair or the head or beard or to wear perfume on any part of the body. 
uh, while on Hajj, uh, while on, I'm sorry, it's not permitted to perform a marriage ceremony or to have sexual intercourse or to, or anything sexual at all. So while the ihram, looking or touching with lust is haram. Obviously, it's always haram with someone who's not your spouse. But even with one spouse, it is haram to look at one spouse with lust or to touch one spouse with lust, right? It is haram to uh, uh, to harm any animal, whether domesticated or wild. Um, that would mean you can't slaughter animals. Um, so you, can you slaughter animals on Hajj? Yeah, right. You have an, a chicken with you and you want to eat it. You can eat it. Right? So uh, maybe the, I have to look at the statement the Arabic in here in a second. Uh, but what it means, so wild animals, you can't hunt in the sacred place or while in a haram. Right? And a woman, a man are the same with regard to these prohibitions. Right? The only exception is clothes. A woman can wear any clothes she wants. She just can't cover her face. And uh, a man can, can, can has, has to wear clothes that surround his body. Uh, without being sewn. So, for example, they like a like a like a the way that a towel surrounds your body, right? So those kind of things like that, and he can't cover his head, um, etc. Inshallah. And then we're going to go on to morals. Inshallah. Ta'ala, next week. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wasallam. Subhanallah wa bihamdik. أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك